if there's one thing that's always been a major feature of human nature, it's the innate urge to make sense of seemingly nonsensical situations. It's the very cornerstones of science and philosophy, after all. It's also how we got religion, conspiracy theories, and gossip columnists. Our inquisitiveness is limited only by our imagination and restraint. So, when we see the Starship Enterprise appear on screen with a prominent registry number of NCC-1701, more than a few fans wondered just what NCC stood for and began concocting all sorts of schemes to explain this mystery. Naval construction contract is one prevalent explanation. Naval Curtis craft is another one that was floating around for a while, and still others can be dug up from around the internet. The producers of Star Trek, however, didn't feel the least bit constrained by these ideas, which is probably for the best, but I'll get to that later. The truth of the matter is, NCC-1701 wound up as the Enterprise's registry number simply because it was easily readable from a distance, or more to the point, on a television screen of 19 inches or smaller, and really didn't mean anything when initially worked up. The NCC part was inspired by the tail numbers of present-day aircraft, NC mean United States commercial, and CC, well, at least to Matt Jeffrey's eyes, was a Russian plane, Managed to pr provide a slightly familiar touch to this futuristic spacecraft to make it clear that this is an Earth ship with folks on board we can still relate to. Well, 1701 was settled on because 1, 7, and 0 are the three numerals that are least likely to be mistaken for other numbers, with the, one, with the second 1 on the, along with the second C being there for balance. Matt Jeffries did cook up some after-the-fact rationalizations for the registry, like NZC representing some joint effort between the U.S. and Soviet Union. The whole United Earth concept wasn't exactly fleshed out just yet, with 1701 representing the 17th Starship class, the first one off the line. It's debatable how well this scheme would have worked in the long run, and since nobody picked up on this idea anyway, it's just an interesting, while wow, non-binding footnote in the history of the show. Since we don't see any registries that start with anything other than NCC during the initial run of the original series, so we're going to skip ahead to the animated series, where we encounter various freighters with more unusual re registry numbers. The USS Huron from the Pirates of Orion, or Orion as they say on the show, God knows why, sported a registry of NCC F1913. And the two robot freighters from More Troubles, More Troubles had registries of NCC G1465 and, as best can be determined, NCC G1415. All we can determine from this is that registries are different for freighters than full fledged starships, and freighters with crews have different registries than automated ones. Interesting start, but still not much to go on. So let's fast forward here to Star Trek III The Search for Spock, where we are first shown that a Starfleet vessel with a registry other than NCC, namely the USX Excelsior. From the context of the scenes, specifically Kirk's description of the massive ship as the Great Experiment, it's a pretty safe assumption that the, like those aforementioned aircraft tan numbers, the X stands for experimental. Again, not much, but it's another piece of the puzzle. It also shows folks that uh, in charge are starting to think things through a bit more, Especially when the Excelsior gets a registry change to NCC-2000 in Star Trek VI Undiscovered Country, and we see the ship well past its testing phase and it's now an active duty starship. So far, we have enough to determine that NCC means an active duty ship, NX means an experimental prototype, and letters mixed in with the numbers have something to do with the nature of the ship. So let's skip ahead to the next generation and subsequent spin-off shows where we start seeing some more re registry diversity. We got ships like the SS Vico, with its registry of NAR-18834, and the Vulcan ship Tapau NSP-17938, and a pattern starts to emerge. So put it all together, and N appears to represent a Federation registered starship. A would indicate a civilian ship from Earth, while S would be a, a Vulcan registered ship. And I presumably other planets would have other letters, you know, the Andorians would have something else, and Tellarites. A C would indicate that the ship is registered to uh, the Federation government. And a second C starts to point in, you know, I guess, towards Starfleet type thing. And there are, you know, again, and then throw back to, you know, present day tail numbers. N represents the United States. These don't have to represent, you know, in, in air, airport codes are similar, you know. It's just a, num a number from the word. It doesn't have to be the first letter of the word. There's some very bizarre aircraft co airport codes out there, and the air and the country codes the same thing here. The N represents the United States, and uh, the Soviets, you know, the Russians, you know, had CC, but the, in, in Cyrillic, it's an S. It's a, it, it gets weird. But yeah, there, there is the system did eventually emerge 
the, it wasn't there before. It was just, you know, it looks pretty. Yeah. But they started, okay, well, this will be that. And then we, but then we got the question of just backing up a little bit of why just within Starships, within the original series, it was just a wide range of numbers. It's pretty well nailed down that the Constitution was NCC-1700. And with the Enterprise being the first ship following that, you know, with NCC-1701. So there is some kind of sequence involved here. But you can't really read too much into that either, because you also have several, you know, clearly Constitution class ships with registries that were slightly below that one one six, you know, one six, you know, range. So what the hell is going on there? And of course, the constellation is the big elephant in the room there with the one zero one seven. Here's where we start getting a little you know, esoteric here, and you got to play around the fist and loose here. So get one. The first thing is, yeah, ignore the number. Because this is a very old model of mine. In fact, I think I might have built this in high school. But this is not necessarily a Constitution-class starship. One thing, with uh, the advent of Enterprise, especially when the uh, proposed fifth season refit that never happened on screen, but we have seen examples since then, that was the pattern set forth when they were, they were building that way. Because pre-Federation Starfleet, with the Earth Starfleet, the prefix code was more like the U.S. Navy. It indicated what type of ship. So the Enterprise NX-01 was an NX-class starship, Columbia NX-02, and so forth. And there are some of the background ships, NV, NW. It's, you know, I don't know what an N, NA would be. Maybe it you know, could have been the uh, what became known as the Daedalus class. Who knows? Because you know, Doug Drexler did tell me that he felt the, the Daedalus class was pre-NX. So that puts it, okay, don't worry about that. that. That's an older ship that hang, that held on a lot longer than anybody thought. But I've, you know, I had to call it something, so I've called the old AMT model the Bonhomme Richard class. It's sort of an homage to the Starfleet battle stuff. But, you know, if you really dig in the details on there, it is not the same proportions as the 11-footer, the Constitution-class ship. And by that, and you know, if you compare the bridge models, figure the bridge models are universal. Lots of ships have the same type of bridge. So I figure that's the, the same bridge module as the Constitution class. Then you do that, and the what the and the, the Bonhomme Richard would come in, maybe about you know a few feet shorter, and it's slightly blockier, and the, the angles are not quite the same. So it, it's it's kind of like the thing of like aircraft carriers. There are many classes of aircraft carrier, but they largely look a lot the same. Going back to the Korean War, where they start putting the the angled deck in. But, you know, to the, to the trained eye, you can tell, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a Kitty Hawk class. That's a Nimitz. You know, this is going to be the Gerald Ford class. You know, and it goes on. So by the same thing. And so I figured we got the NX class that set the thing. And I have the the, uh, the Disco Prize. I figured, okay, it's too good a design to toss out. It's John Eves doing a very good job, but it's not the Enterprise. And there's lots of call. In fact, it, that was his proposal for the NX class way back. But Burner rejected that. It looks too much like Kirk should try again. And Doug Drexler came in with the NX, and here's just that. So this fits in very nicely, though, between the NX and the Bonhomme Richard. I call it the Yorktown class. That's a little throwback to the original you know, pitch for Star Trek. You know, yes, it's Yorktown. And so the way the sequence I see it going is you got the NX. They hung around when, you know, with Federation founded and on there. I don't know what they did with the X. But the registry code at that point, but who knows? That's something for writers to work out. And then they moved on from there to the Yorktown, and then to the Bonhomme Richard, and then eventually, you know, by this time we're into the figured, you know, the the Bonhomme Richard probably dates back to the twenty two twenties, with the Constitution coming on the twenty two twenty two forties, with the with the, you know, the Enterprise being twenty two forty five. Now, figure. This is where you, know, the, the, you got the Miranda class, and their numbers are in them. They're, they're in the 180 Rangers, and, and also Oberth class. They're there with the, you know, the 500 series. From there, we, I think we can infer the Oberth is actually a lot older than you, th than you think. It's been, you know, they were just refitting ships all over the place. And also, for, you know, and another side is that the Oberth class. I forgot that lower pod is a, is a uh, add on pit. So don't worry about trying to, oh, no, no, don't worry, it's, it's an automated thing, it's just, you know, everything is up in the saucer. And it's just sort of, and that is the ship, the saucer and the nacelles on there, with the engineering somewhere in there. 
And you just add on bits here and there. You make it a tug, or it's it's a it's a utility ship. And that and they were been around forever. Then five, you know, I think the like the Grissom was like five sixty something. But anyway, when they start gearing up though for the Constitution class, you still got a lot of Bonhomme Richard class either in construction or slated for construction. But to beef up those numbers, either they are... It's like the Space Shuttle Challenger. Well, the, the, the Columbia... Actually, let's go back to it. Because when they started doing space shuttles, the Enterprise came up. That was originally intended to go into orbit. Don't buy this thing. Oh, it's always been a test field. No, it was, it was going to go in orbit. But in between time, while it's being developed, the budget gets cut. It, the, the launch vehicle is not going to be as powerful. So guess what? The only way the Enterprise is going to get launched is if it's empty. You know, it, you can't carry a cargo because it's too damn heavy now because the launch vehicle's in. So, Columbia is still in construction. So they managed to lighten it some during construction, and then and that and as it was, they could barely function. Really, it was the heaviest of the entire fleet. Challenger was the first one to come out all new specs. So I forget something similar happened when they started doing Constitution class. You start. Retrofitting, because the Constitution and the Bonhomme, Richard, would be close enough that it wouldn't be much, while well, it's still in construction, to change things a bit here and then make it a Constitution class. While it's still got the same registry, because that's signed differently. The registry numbers would not be assigned by class. It's a matter, it is, you know, kind of a con- construction, it's a sequence of construction. Like this, you know, is a registry, that's your registry, and the class is something totally different. Nothing, not really related to the number, except the fact that this was during this period we we're building mostly constitutions and Mirandas and other things. So they, you know, these ships like the Exeter and the Excalibur, they would have been, they were slotted originally to be Bonhomme Rich class, but then at the last minute they either retrofitted or just started off as constitution class because that they're not ready to come up with the sequence yet. These things take years to plan out and build. Okay. Even by Star Trek's, you know, time period, you can't just snap your fingers and have a ship. So you gotta have, get everything lined up. The bureaucracy is eternal. You gotta have lined up. You got the number slotted up, and okay, in this date we're gonna start building this ship, and that, you know. So yeah, the Constitution was built in twenty two forty. The planning for the Constitution class was probably done in the twenty two thirties or, or, or twenty, you know, no, the turn of the twenty third century. They play. Okay, we got we got to move on here. <laughs> These bond home riches are great, but we got to you know think about the next design. It, it's all moving on. So, so at least by the twenty two thirties, the constitution was already probably planned and scheduled. But again, you know the bond home riches there. They then you're going back into the thousands numbers wise, and that's why you got the constellation. And I also, it's kind of buried at the moment, but I have the discovery. As that version ship, the one zero three one, there would have been a Bonhomme Richard class era ship. Screw the Crossfield class, okay? It, it, it was nice to see Scott Crossfield get a shout out in that way, but no, the, the ditch that thing. It's, it's horrible. It's a pizza cutter. But that's how I see it going. Okay. So yes, the later ones, they are Constitution class. They were slotted originally, but they got changed, you know, before they got built, and the beef up the numbers, the Constitution class type thing. But the, again, the, you don't get too slavish to this number means that ship. No, that number just means when it was built. <laughs> and I'm sure they go nuts when it's like when someone does do a note. Because I think with the constellation, oh, it's just sick. No, the, the, the number the number is original to the ship. It's like number plates in Britain. Yeah. That's the number it gets when it rolls off the line. And that's why it's rather unusual for a ship to retain you know, for the next ship to have the number of the previous ship like Enterprise A or, or go, you know, the Yamato sorry Mike <laughs> but spoken dialogue especially as specific as what Riker said he reads the number first and identifies the ship by one you know, NCC 1305E the USS Yamato I don't care about your background graphics, which can barely be seen on the most sets, you know, where you're sitting back away. That kind of defines it, so you're stuck with that number. And using that, you can roll backwards here, okay? There's been five, or, you know, six of these, you know, you know, 
and they kept the name of that. So the Amato must have been one kick-ass ship back in the day. But back it up, the original USS Yamato would have been a Bon Home Richard Quest. With the probably a one, you know, one. I'll be generous and say the 1301A was probably a refit constitution. <laughs> and somewhere in there, you got, you know, a B and a C. No, so. so eventually, you got the, the Galaxy Class E. So. But that's something for writers to work out. Okay, this is very broad strokes. So hopefully, that cleared things up a bit or just confused everyone further. So we'll talk at you later. Thank <laughs> you.